Yeah, that's how we do it. Evil and fucking mean. We're the mean machine. Welcome to the Rift Crew. I'm your host, Steve Mitchell, back for another great episode uh, here in the realm. And as always, uh, or at least this year, uh, I'm joined by my uh, great co-host, Skull. How are you doing over there, Skull? In the Chamber of the Cosmos. Good to be with you. Here with my good friend, Steve Oz. I'm in Off Again, On Again, DC Bomb Rock Band, Black Manta. I've been in the DC scene for over 30 years and know people from all over the scene. And I've been invited to fill in for Andrew for a while, and I'm really excited to be here. So, thanks to be thank, uh, great to be a part of Riff Crew in Rome. So, so how, how you been, Steve? I've been okay, but um, I'm under lockdown at the moment. And I can see one man that's not under lockdown is, uh, of course, Rob Machetti from MOD. How you doing, Rob? What's happening, boys? So, all it, right. It looks like you got a bit of freedom there in New York now. Um, how, how are things, just to kick off? Well, we escaped New York, and uh, we bought a house down in Florida because uh, we came down here for vacation a couple of times and realized that it was wide open. Um, so New York, we were just on lockdown, and everything was dying up there, literally. So spur of the moment, we just said, let's get the hell out of there. And, uh, Where do you live? I, I grew up in happened? Florida. 
We're in Port Charlotte right now. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I grew up on the East Coast outside of West Palm. Yeah, yeah, we're on the, we're on the Gulf of Mexico side. <laughs> okay. It's oh, always man. beautiful weather, right? Yeah, not today, but it, it, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's raining now, but I think it's like the, this is the first week it's rained since we've been here for the last month, so. But it's awesome, you know, we need to change the scenery, and it just turns out that I'm three exits away from Gary Mesco from Propane, my old, my old band leader back in the day, so we reconnected. I hadn't seen him for probably um, 23 years, and uh, that was pretty awesome. So we've been hanging out a lot. We're going to go see him right now. That's cool. So you guys, have you heard about the whole cicada um, invasion up here in the mid-Atlantic? Have you heard about that? No. Okay, you guys avoided it then. Um, What's that about? I just, I brought a couple of specimens right here. I wanted to show you. They're flying around. Like every 17 years, we have this brood X. And there's like, there's a million of them outside. It's like an invasion of zombified flying insects. It's really like, crazy. Like, like locusts? They look like locusts? Yeah, they're huge. They're about an inch. Some of them can be an inch to two inches long. It's really, it's a crazy 17 year infestation. I figured yeah. I'd pass that on to all the people that, that aren't that aren't dealing with it like we are. It, it It's a lot, man, and it's crazy out there. Right? You can hear them screeching and you can hear the hum of the zombified cicadas. It's, it's pretty wild out there. So we, we've but, been, um, with that reconnection, Rob, are you looking to, to write new music together? Oh, with Gary? Yeah. Um, nothing's ever off the table as far as, you know, anything can happen. But right now, there's nothing nothing planned. You know what I mean? We, I, I'm, you know, I'm currently with MOD, and I really hadn't even planned on writing with him because uh, my my brain just isn't in that mode right now and if, and if I was going to try to write heavy stuff it wouldn't be genuine so um, I'm just kind of on, on pause in that mode right now uh, maybe I'm not angry anymore I don't know <laughs> well that's a good thing <laughs> yeah, I was an angry young man young man too myself I know what you mean it's hard to be angry for, all the time if music for me is expression and uh right you know, I express myself the way it, 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 whatever comes out comes out. The genre, the genre finds me. I'm not like working towards a genre, you know. But mm -hmm. um, uh, I, right now, I'm just not writing that kind of stuff, and I'm not about to force myself to. So, so M -S -S MOD is more fun then. It lets you blow off steam then. Yeah, well, I just love playing the SOD stuff and, and the old MOD classics live. I mean, it's got. Right. So many records to choose from. And even when, when I hooked up with Billy again, he's like, what songs do you want to play off the records you were on? And I said, none. I want to play like the, 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 the classic stuff, you know? Um, right. I didn't, there was no oh, ego attached to Well, I'm back. I want to play the stuff off my records. It's like, no. Right. I want well, to play the shit that people want to hear. I was more of a spectator on right. stage. I know those songs inside out. I didn't have to this pay attention. This album right here, right? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, we played a bunch off of that. <laughs> All right. Um, it's a classic yeah, but I don't know like about writing with Gary, though. I mean, I, I really haven't been asked to, but I don't know if I would be able to at this point. You know, I probably could. I probably could. Well, with, with MOD, because you mentioned you weren't planning to write with MOD, is that something that Billy tends to like to run with himself or he likes to get well, others involved? The last record was so damn good. I'm one of those people who's going to be like, I'm not going to interrupt that process. You know, like he's on, if he's in the zone writing, I'm not about to trip mm -hmm. him up and say, here's a bunch of my stuff. So right. that last record he did was so awesome that uh, I'm going to let him keep running with it. And if he wants me, you know, he obviously wants me to play on it, but we don't even know when that's going to happen. You know, uh, MLD works in very uh, sporadic time frame you know he doesn't you, have to like how did you reconnect with billy uh he went to japan with sod a few years back and uh the crew guys 
we shared a crew for MOD back in the day and, and SOD. Some of those guys went with them. So one of the crew guys called me, and I hadn't talked to Billy for about 10 years. And one of the crew guys called me, said, you got to call Billy. Uh, the entire tour, all we were doing was talking about you and all the stupid shit you did on the road and how you made everybody <laughs> laugh the entire time. And, mm. and uh, I said, you know what? Enough time has passed because he was mad when I quit. I, I quit. I, I, you know, got out of MOG to join propane, you know? Mm. Um, so he wasn't happy about it. We didn't speak for a while, and, but it all goes away. Just like with me and Gary, we weren't on the best of terms when I quit. Sure. And now it's, it's been, you know, 20 It's like a years. family, man. Being in a band is like, like being in a family. Yeah. The stupid shit goes away. And, you know, the people that you're meant to stay in touch with, you do. And the people that you don't, there's a reason why you don't. Yeah. So the important ones, and I'm not talking about them being important, but the ones that actually meant something to my life other than music. I was part of Gary's family. And, you know, I was part of Billy's family. I wasn't just an employee, so. How'd you end up in, better. how did you end up in MOD in the first, in the beginning? I was in the studio um, recording a, a record with my first band, Mutilation. Mm. And we were kind of lost at that point. One member was in rehab and we were kind of changing. We had the wrong name. We, we did a thrash album. Then the second album came out and we were kind of leaning more towards like prong and uh, clutch sure. and stuff like that. Then gotcha. we had the wrong name. So we were just kind of in the studio recording stuff. And uh, the engineer was Steve Evans. And he had just recorded an MOG record, uh, Rhythm of Fear, in 92. Okay. Billy didn't have a bass player. So, yeah, engineer, producer, Steve Evans, said he'd be perfect. And I said, what do I got to do? He said, learn every SOD song and every MOD <laughs> song. So, I did. You're like, done. I, yeah, when I met, but I knew them in my brain because I, I was a fan. Sure. So, that's the easiest part for me to learn is... Once I know them in my head, I can, I can transpose it to the instrument. Yeah, we're, play, so. we're, we're about the same age. We, we both grew up with that shit, man. So, yeah. Yeah, man, I, love I was all a that. senior in high school when USA from out, so. Right. Yeah, you know, and I just learned all the stuff. And my first, what I, what I would call an audition, was more like a rehearsal, you know? I went in there and just played everything. And uh, next thing you know, we were in Europe touring that record and then came home and made the evolution and toured that and that's when i met the guys at propane i mean billy is you know legendary he's, he's quite the character what, what was it like touring with him and being around with him back then in the beginning well you think maybe it's an act like sergeant d is a character but <laughs> it's not an act it's really who he is it's billy yeah it's not a, he's not putting it on Milano Mosh. Yeah, it's, it's all real. He, he lives and breathes it, and he doesn't care about, you know, much. Like, he wants the product to be good. He wants the show to be good. Sure. All the other is crap, you know. You know, he was a CBGB's kid, punk kid, you know. Anthrax plucked him out of CBGB's, put him as the front man as SOD. He wasn't even asking for that, you know. Just want, he just liked playing music, so. Well, he definitely seems and like he has a pretty, like a funny sense of humor. Like he's definitely out there. Yeah, he's one of a kind. That's for sure. I love the guy. That was my brother. You know. We, we oh, think, do you guys think you, you'll be touring soon? Um, not sure. We, you know, everything got post. We were supposed to continue the 2019 tour, and everything got postponed and moved. And uh, as of right now, there's nothing really in the in the in the furnace, you know. I think him yeah, and the drummer are writing a new record right now, you know. Yeah, Possibly. I don't know if you've heard of it. That up here in Maryland is a thing called the Maryland Death Fest, and you guys would be yeah, perfect for it. it. Yeah, you guys, you guys should check yeah. check it out. There's a lot of a lot of yep. old school crash bands play. We're actually, you know, kind of turning down festivals right now. Billy's have. Uh, Billy's got some other priorities he's got to sort out right now. 
and whenever he's ready, if, if the circumstances are right, we'll just gear up and go back out again, you know? Sure, sure. So is it something that you can sort of turn on, turn off in terms of the momentum? Because you guys, you know, obviously I think it's 2017, the album came out. You guys did a massive tour in 2019. I think you had a big show with Exodus booked and then sort of everything stopped. Is, is, is it something that, you know, you basically can make a phone call or Billy makes a phone call and you guys are, you know, back in fifth gear kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, luckily, you know, when you're dealing with, with pros, you rehearse a couple of times and you go, you know, uh, there's a reason why these bands have all made it. The, the guys, they're not amateurs, you know, so whoever... Whoever's in the band, they learn the material or they suffer the wrath of Billy or they're never invited back. So sure. when I show up, when I show up, it's, you know, I take time out of my life and my family and my job to fly out to Texas to rehearse. I'm not going there to hang out, party, I'm going there to rehearse. And sure. one or two rehearsals, we're ready to go. And so, I mean, something important pops up where Billy thinks it's, I don't challenge him. If, if he, he'll let me know, hey, there's a festival here, you want to do it? And, and that's basically how it works at this point, you know. We're not we're not full-time uh, road dogs anymore, which is kind of good for me. Sure. You know, we all have serious, we all have regular jobs and, and lives and families, so. But luckily, MOD is etched in the history books where we can kind of just, you know, play whenever we want or wherever we want all the festivals that bands are fighting to get on and play for free we get invited to play them you know so that's that's really good yeah you guys are crossover legends man <laughs> that's awesome thanks man and just, just yeah because in australia obviously the world's a bit different how how big did mod get you know sort of in the 80s and 90s um you know they seem to always be the openers for the overkills and the, the exoduses and stuff like that. It never crossed, it never broke that thing like suicidal broke through with how will I laugh and lights camera. Uh, this band never really broke through in a big way, which in a way kind of gave it longevity. It wasn't just a flash in the pan, you know? Because um, most bands hit big and then they disappear because they can't match it. So Billy just pumps out records every every few years, sometimes five years, sometimes eight years, or whatever it is. And uh, that's usually how it goes. But it, it's, he's not a slave to the band. You know what I mean, he's a slave to his art, but he's not using MOD to pay his mortgage. None of us are. Well, I wanted to ask you, how you know, you grew up, you're a New York you know, New York kids. So how, how did you get started in the bit music business? Um, just uh, my brothers were into heavy music and I was a lot younger than them. And I'm just staring at their album covers. And <laughs> sure, that's how it, right. Them. I dig. Yeah, and they influenced me into Sabbath and Ozzy and Zeppelin. But then I ended up introducing them to Metallica and Anthrax and stuff like that. Did you did you start off as a guitar player or a bass player or? Uh, I wanted to play drums, and and then ended up playing drums. But the, mainly it was guitar and bass, and and bass was because uh, no one ever wanted to do it. Exactly. So like on the early demos of stuff, I I, en I ended up playing bass, and then realized right. I was probably a better bassist than a guitarist. And then do you I, have a do you have a favorite bass player? With propane, I was able to. Uh, Cliff Burton. Right on. Definitely Cliff. <laughs> right on. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I tell everyone. Uh, you know, listening to that stuff. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I tell I mean, I love Metallica up to a certain point, but when Cliff died, the band died with him. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, Justice for All was pretty good still, and then, and then it just kind of changed. But, you know, Everybody says they sold out, but I think everyone who tried to copy them were the sellouts. They had to do something different. Sure. Because everyone was trying to do what they were doing. So. This is kind of how it goes. Yeah. 
and looking back on your your time uh in the in the 90s like how was it shifting from mod to propane and what was it like being in propane well we did the uh we did a tour from like beginning of september all the way up to like christmas eve opening for propane it was like a co-headlining thing that we shared a bus and i was playing bass with mod but uh mod wasn't doing sound checks so i would get up there and play drums and play guitar and play bass check the mics and propane was watching that and then they saw me on stage live with billy playing bass so they're like okay you can play guitar it's kind of good on stage so when the tour ended uh i went home for christmas and like a month later they called me from uh, switzerland i, I know exactly where they were because i played at that place a lot of times they called me from there and said well uh, we're throwing punker out of the band. Could you be ready in like a week? And I, without even thinking about it, just said, yeah. And I didn't even own a guitar at that point. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Mm. So I had to learn. At that point, they only had two records out. So I learned two of the two records, which I already knew them in my brain from touring with them. I just had, borrowed an acoustic guitar from a friend. I knew they had all the gear once I got in the band. So I just brushed up on some of their stuff. Learned a couple of Crumb Sucker songs that they did live at that point because they were still in the, in the infancy stage of propane. And a week later, I think we were in Europe, you know, and it's the same thing. It wasn't an audition. It was rehearsal. I don't know. It was, it was a great, it was a smooth transition. And I loved playing guitar again because I never had, I had never done it on a grand level up to that point. I always played guitar on demos and but never on a record, hmm. never in front of thousands of people, you know. Uh, so it was really fun to get back to guitar. But it's 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 weird because I can't see someone like Jason Newstead playing guitar in a band and playing bass in a band. And if, for some reason, it seems natural with me to do to either one. It's totally different. It's like to me, it would be like playing drums in one band and then playing guitar in, in, in another band. You know, that, that's how drastically different those instruments are. To me, at least, you know, I'm not a, a guitar player on bass. You know, right. so when, when I you, kind when of you, figured out. Each so when, when when you're writing music, do you find that you what, what what instrument do you normally pick up the most when you're trying to come up with new music? Guitar. Well, guitar, really. And uh, these days, sometimes now it's even piano. Just searching for something different, you know, because. Sometimes metal can be uh, really restricting melody-wise, you know. So constantly searching for new melodies just with different instruments, you know, forces you to do something different. But it's usually guitar, usually an, uh, an acoustic guitar too. Now, you mentioned before the interview that um, you've been working with uh, Daryl McDaniels um with some music because daryl was involved with uh, run dmc uh back in the 80s uh, well, i guess they were biggest in the 80s um how did you hook up with daryl uh, i wrote a song on an album that i don't want to mention <laughs> and uh he loved it he was just a band that i was part of for, for a brief moment and uh somehow he uh heard the song and started a posting about it on social media it was a very bizarre song for a metal album and, uh, but he loved it and reached out that he wanted to do something together. So our first day, we wrote probably three or four songs just in our first meeting. And we realized we had chemistry. And uh, that's how I initially hooked up with him. And then every so often, he'll hit me up because he needs a song for a sporting event or, or, a, uh, or a team or something like that. So I've been working with him on and off. And this last last thing he hit me up with, I was about to go on tour with MOD. He was looking for something that I really could provide. I said yes. And it turns out that my wife had a track that fit what he was looking for. So I spoke to her about it. We submitted it to him and he fell in love with it. And uh, that's basically what we're doing right now. We just recorded the track about a month ago. They're in the process of shooting the music video for it as, as we speak. 
uh, it's being edited right now. And he's just a really cool guy. He inspires us. And he's uplifting. And what, whatever becomes of it, uh, the payoff is just being in the studio with the guy more so than monetarily. Is that a hip hop style music or what type of music? Um, he's rapping over it, but my wife plays the piano. So, and she plays drums as well. So we were listening to cool. a lot of like, we were listening to a lot of like, she listens to very, uh, I don't know what the word is, eclectic music, you know? Um, sure, sure. I'm like, oh, I, I go, wow, this is some pretty obscure stuff. And then I look and it's like four, four million hits on it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm the one who's obscure, you know? So we were listening to like some Wu-Tang Clan where they use piano lines in the songs but we weren't intentionally writing for him we, were, we just write both of us you know we, we sit in the house um and just just kind of uh venture a little bit with the instruments and, and we record everything so something just jumped out at me that i thought was really amazing and uh when i showed it to d he, he said the same thing so yeah it's hard to explain it's almost like a combination of like November Rain meets Bittersweet Symphony meets Cream by uh, Wu Tang Clan. You know, it's 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 a, it's very hard. I can't to wait to hear it, man. Yeah, it's cool. It's a cool art project because me, Cat, my wife, her name's Cat. Me, Cat, and D couldn't be further from each other musically, but it meshes together really well. You know. Well, you have to reach out to us and let us know when you, when it's finished. Uh, that'll that'll be awesome to check out. Yeah, maybe we'll debut it on your show or something. With that. We'll, like, we'll send you guys the video. Sure. You, know, you guys could, uh, it's, you know, it's cool. It's, it's a very artsy, cool project. And, you know, it's something that D doesn't usually do. You know what I mean? Um, but for some reason... Uh, he just clicks with our personalities. That's more more than more important to me than anything. He's our friend, and it's easier to work with people like that instead of battling each other. And but, I, I guess uh, from, from your personal perspective, uh, you you had some uh, uh, exposure to the music industry before it imploded with uh, the the internet and whatnot. And obviously, Daryl was, you know, as <laughs> got as big as anyone um, during those heavy days of the music industry. What's it, what was it like or if transitioning from, you know, the, the era of the rock star to the era of, you know, every band, almost every band's an indie band now. It didn't affect me at all because we didn't, we never relied on the record companies for anything. You know, like when I joined MOD, it was self-sufficient. We had our own money. And propane too. We weren't taking mafia loans from record companies where you never pay them back and you're always in debt. Um, so we would take, a, a, we would use a minimal amount of money to make a solid recording, put it out, and never expect to see royalties anyway. You know what I mean? Like we were, we got paid from the road. So some of the bigger bands, there were they're living kind of like we've been living, you know, record companies weren't paying any of our bills. Um, record sales weren't paying any of our bills shows were. So what you got to do is go out and play. If you want to make money, uh, it didn't affect us at all. It affected a lot of people with the music industry. Uh, people who weren't musicians, telling musicians what they had to do and how they had to do it. Like they had the answer. If they knew how to write hit songs, they would have written them themselves. So you got some nerdy dork telling you, you know, your song's too long or you got to change this or change that. And it's like, we never relied on that. We just, we just wrote our own stuff, built the fan base. And if it was small, we, we didn't care. You know, the, our fans appreciated it. And that's all we really cared about. If, can't please everyone you please yourself and people see that now it's not 
in the masses, but we were never trying to achieve commercial success with any of these bands. Propane was a top 50 European billboard charting band without albums recorded. We recorded them in my house. Right there, we had a top 50 record. The next record we did was in the top 70, and the record company was looking at it like a failure because we didn't, we, didn't go, we didn't chart higher than 50. And I said, we don't even belong on these charts. And mm. we recorded this record in my living room. So right. how are we not great that we're, that we're even in Billboard magazine? You know what I mean? Like, that's not how we judge the band, you know? It was a miracle that we even made the top 50 or the top 100 or the, the top 1,000 for that fact. I mean, there's millions of bands, thousands of bands, and everyone's fighting for the same thing, you know? Whether it's for MOD or the stuff that you're doing with Daryl, how, how do you cut through? Like, as you said, there's a million bands out there. How do you cut through so that people can actually connect with your music and hear your music and know that, you know, MOD still banging out records and, you know, you're still playing music? Well, you know, Billy re-signed with Megaforks. Then they put out the original Metallica records, the Anthrax records, Testament, Overkill. He resigned with them for that last record, but that was just a one and done deal. Mm, okay. And uh, you know, it was their job to get it out there to the to the people, and whether they did or not, I have no idea. But we were able to go do a headlining tour, and uh, with Daryl, he, he's never going to top what he did in the '80s. They were, they were on Rolling Stone magazine, and he's got a Grammy, he's got an Emmy. This is a passion project, you know. So mm. if you stumble across it. On, on iTunes, then it's it's a hidden gem, you know. That's how we kind of look at it. If, if if it starts to get some traction, though, of course we're gonna go out and you know see what happens with it. But it won't be a disappointment or a failure if it doesn't, because we're not really we're not really expecting that. I wanted to ask you something, and um, I wanted to go back to the early 90s a little bit. Um, and I wanted to ask you, because I'm a huge fan, Peter Steele fan. Did, did you, did your paths ever cross? Did you, did you ever get to, you know, see Carnivore? Or were you into Typo back in the day or anything like that? Um, propane opened for Typo in, in Poland. And uh, I got to hang out with him, and he was very cool. You know, cool. Uh, it was a, it was very bizarre though, because the, the whole show I remember it was uh, Dog Eat Dog, Life of Agony, Morbid Angel, Wow, Propane, uh, propane um, and and Typo. So all day people are moshing and going crazy. When Typo came on, it was as if he had the whole audience hypnotized in a trance. It was right so on. bizarre. But he had this weird stage presence that just kind of. The, the he had that amazing charisma. They were dead silent in between songs. He's not like, hey, what's up? He's not a hype man. He's like a vampire up there. But it was really. <laughs> right. It was weird. Lord it, of it the was undead. Cool, I, never, I never seen anything like it. How, how, how he uh, had the crowd in the palm of his hand and he was just. He was quiet and peaceful and you know it was very very odd but i thought it was amazing he was doing the complete opposite of what we were doing we were like a bunch of monkeys on fire on stage <laughs> and he was standing there with a bottle of wine that's uh, funny he had his rack for his amp on stage up front with him by his microphone so he could change the sound he didn't have foot pedals he had his whole rig up front mm. and uh, he had a bottle of wine on it and he talked very quietly in between songs. And then after the show, we were all hanging out. And he was very cool, you know. It's a shame that he died. You know? Yeah, I asked because you guys are both from New York. I figured your paths might have crossed at some time. Yeah, I mean, I, didn't, I wasn't around for his early Connor War days. And, um, but when Typo hit, you know, we were doing our thing. And, of course, our, our Europe. All those bands always play together, which is great. And as you mentioned, you were out on tour in 2019. 
across Europe, what were the highlights of that? Because you, you did make some uh, video travelogues or documentaries, sort of David Attenborough style. I have every show documented, you know, at least one song from every show. But I was more about all the uh, the traveling and the backstage stuff and me basically busting Billy's balls the entire time just trying to make everyone laugh. Uh, the highlight of it for me was Russia. Uh, I'd never played there before. I didn't know what to expect. I was a little nervous about it, and it turned out being the best two shows of the tour for me. Steve is a bit of fan a fan of Russia. <laughs> yeah, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of great Russian bands that nobody have ever heard of because um, one they were, they were in the Soviet Union, or many of them were in the Soviet Union. The other one is they they usually have their songs in Russian, so people sort of tune out. But they've got a lot of great music. Mm. And as yeah, you know, it was great. You know that oh, as you know, yeah, the the fans, you know, the the metal fans are just as crazy as anyway. They were singing every word to, to every song, and it was incredible. Wow, they just like rock stars, and uh, I I was so pleasantly surprised by that. It, it's definitely the what I remember the most about the entire tour. You've 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 had a bit of a life change moving to Florida. Would you would you be open to being a road dog again, or that's that's in the past? Um, you know, after I quit propane in '98, I got into sanitation. Uh, so I'm, I'm 24 years a garbage man now, and that's 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 what bought my house, and that's what pays my bills, and uh, and gives my family health benefits, and all the things that you know 50 year old musicians never have. <laughs> um, sure man so what i do is i save my vacation time and i and if something comes up and i and what i what i don't do is i don't save it with the hopes that we're going on the road if i have available time uh i'll i'll go do something you know what i mean but i'm not uh gonna not go on vacations because of a tour that might come up i'm living my life and sure you know, if, if I'm not, I mean, I can't really say about the road thing at this point right now, you know, it's ask me tomorrow, you know, like uh, things change mm -hmm. so quickly, but I was completely done with the music business in 98. And then since then I've made two records with the band, worked with DMC, rejoined MOD, you know, I've done a lot since I said I was done. So I don't want to sound like Kiss or Motley Crue on their farewell tour. <laughs> One oh, more that... tour tour too. Uh, yep. You broke up there, but yeah, oh, like I've Ozzy, never, no never, more tour tour part two. Yeah, I, I don't want to say I'll never do it because if, if I do it, then I look like an idiot. I just mm. say that I I, have, I don't I don't have a I don't have a crystal ball and I don't know what the future holds. But that's the beauty of, of you know our life right now is that we don't think too far ahead. It seems to be working for us. For the younger bands out there, for younger musicians, what would be the, you know, the biggest lesson or the biggest lessons that you've had in your, your music career? Just do it because you love it. I'm not, uh, I was never a frustrated musician. Music has provided me with like therapy and travel and, and experiences and friends all over the world. Um, but I, uh, I just did it because I loved it, and I still love it. So things will fall in your lap if you're doing if you're doing the right thing. Sometimes there's no guarantee. Just just do it because you love it, and if it's meant to be, you know things will happen. And if it doesn't, don't be discouraged because you know it's it's art, it's music. Some people get it, some people don't. Uh, I would just say, head, right, carpet diem. Yeah. Stick to your guns. If you're trying to get rich or, or make money, go go be in a wedding band. They play every weekend. <laughs> they eat good food and, and they make money. Or go be in a That's cover band. That's true. They make good money, man. Yeah. I was never driven by money. You know, I, I wanted to just mm -hmm. make cool records and write cool music and have people on the other side of the world. I mean, you're in, you're in Australia. How you even know my name is a, is a freaking miracle to a, a, a 17 or a 16-year-old kid. This, in my brain, that's what I still am. So I, I appreciate that you even know who the fuck I am, you know, 
that, that's incredible to me. So, well, I wanted to show you something real quick. Before, I, I totally forgot. I'm wearing my MOD shirt, my original one from back in the day. On the back, it says <laughs> Thrash should be thrashed. <laughs> I've had it for like over 30 years. Oh my God. I think I just saw a moth fly out of the armpit. <laughs> Oh man, oh, that's so awesome! That that's that's true loyalty. You, you should be a European because most Americans turn on their bands once they've had a little ring, a little run of success or failure. Europeans are still listening to Limp Bizkit and Corn and Twisted Sister and bands that we all thought were long gone. Mm. They're still they're loyal to the end, you know. And and to see you wearing that shirt, you know, it it means a lot to me. It might not mean shit to Billy. I don't care about that. <laughs> but <laughs> tell him I wore down, it. <laughs> deep down, I know he does. He appreciates mm. all you guys. You know? That's funny. But that's awesome that you know. I don't even. Ha I wish I had some of the merch from the old tours. You know, I give it away. It doesn't mean anything to me at the time. And then years later, I'm like, oh, I wish I had that poster. Or I wish I had that shirt. Mm. You know, but. When you're living it, you just forget it, but you don't realize you don't realize how important it is until yeah. you know years. When you're living it, you're living it. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned mentioned earlier you guys, uh, you know, sort of knockback offers and stuff like that. Have you ever received an offer? Has MOD ever received an offer to come down to Australia? Because I don't think the that the bands ever uh, yeah, there was, played there was a promoter. There was a promoter out there who was trying to get us out there. But what happens is, I, I don't know the geography of anything. So a promoter hit us up or hit me up. And I go, Billy, you know, someone from Australia wants us to do some shows. And then it turns into, oh, then we got to do Asia. We got to do you know, this and this, it's Japan. And I'm like, what? Why? Why can't we just go to Australia and do a couple of shows? You know, like, every, you know, it's, it's like if we're going to gear up and go, then. Oh, you want to do like an go. Asian tour. Yeah, and I, I have no idea that Asia's anywhere near Australia. I have no clue. So <laughs> it's I would a bad... be all about just it's a long ass flight to go play a handful <laughs> of shows, you know. So they're like, we might as well go capitalize on it. Mm -hmm. And that's where, to me, it starts to be a turnoff to me. I'd rather go to Europe and play grass pop and come home, with, play in front of eighty thousand people, mm. and come home. Instead, we're going to dick around and play a 200-seat cl club and a 300-seat club. And I'd rather just do one clean sweep and one big-ass show, play in front of 80,000 and come home. Mm. You know, leave it all out on the stage. and Because and, what happens is I, I watch videos of the tour. By the middle of the tour and the end of the tour, you're kind of going through the motions a little bit because you're playing the same songs every night. It's, it's, it becomes a job very quickly. I know that uh, you guys were playing a lot of SOD songs um, as a fan. Oh, I yeah, guess you, that's right. you enjoyed, you know, throwing those into the set as well. They're my favorites. I'm not gonna lie. I I, I think uh, being a kid in high school and listening to SOD, and that that album is the first MOD record. I got it right here. SOD. First, yeah, the first MOD record and the first SOD record. Those were the, the albums that came out when Kill 'Em All was out, and, and people were just discovering Anthrax and all this music, including myself. So to be playing these songs, it, it just brings me back to my friend's bedroom, smoking joints and listening to it, and not having any clue that I'd be part of that band in any way. Crossover masterpieces, man. Both of yeah, these albums. It's, I'm still, I still love those songs. I love playing them more than anything, you know, and people singing along to them, and it's huge. Like a dream come true, kind of. Absolutely. It really is. I think that I get more joy playing my own material, but it's, it's a different feeling doing that stuff. You know, it's kind of like pop culture for our generation. Because we grew up with it, man. Yeah, that's the truth. I mean, we were drinking beers by a campfire out in the woods with our friends, you know, 
tripping on mushrooms listening to these albums and next thing you know i'm up on stage <laughs> playing, playing these songs with the guy you know <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know billy personally before i joined i didn't know gary or the crumb suckers or propane guys before mm-hmm. I, I didn't you know i was i really was fan of these guys now we're brothers you know what i mean like I'm, I'm waiting for gary right now at a place um but when i was listening to the crumb suckers in high school i didn't think i'd be friends with these guys or, or brothers with these guys or bandmates but somehow it worked out i just you know i just kept doing what i like and it wasn't it wasn't my goal wasn't to be with them or one of them it was just to as corny as it sounds be the best Rob Machete, you know. Speaking of bands, are you a fan of ZZ Top at all? Because you and Jason have oh, got yeah, the yeah. ZZ Top uh, <laughs> vibe going. I love ZZ Top, honestly. I just amazing saw the best Gandalf documentary. beard. I saw the uh, the documentary on them. Just you know, my wife was away for a week, so that's when I catch up on all my rock documentaries that she hates. <laughs> so um, that was my first was show, man. I love them, and and. I don't play guitar solos, but I play more like uh, Billy Gibbons plays. If I play guitar, mm-hmm. like I like his solos because he's not—he's not Ingvay Malmsteen. He's just bluesy and right. I love, but the Z, the beard had nothing to do with ZZ Top. It had to do with my wife likes it, so <laughs> I said, "Got to do what the wife likes." Yeah, you know, like I tell people, like, they go, "What's with the beard?" I go, "My wife likes it." They go, "Oh, you grew it for your wife?" And I'm like, "I grow a tail for my fucking wife." Oh. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> <laughs> She's covering up. She's shy. She's the shyest rock star you'll ever meet.
and welcome back to the Rift Crew. I uh, hope you enjoyed that a clip from Maniacs. And of course, we saw some more Pizza Death. That's not Pizza Dick Skull. That's to, how I to, hear to it. Clarify. So, <laughs> your crazy Australian accent. You sound like you're from outer space or Mars or something. Well, the Chinese have landed a, a probe on the dark side of the moon, so you know. <laughs> you're maybe you're on, the, on the. You are down under. It's like another planet down there. Well, a dark every, side, everything dark side down the there is it, everything down there is venomous and like you know, oversized. We only have five of the t ten most deadly snakes in the world. Only five. So I think it's, okay. it's, it's exaggerated. Even <laughs> your birds are venomous. Your birds have your poisonous beaks. I think, well, the cass cassowaries are, are um, occasional. It's a rare occur occurrence, but cassowaries do kill humans. They are birds. They're, they're, they're like and that's the name of an Australian death metal band, right? Mate, you probably know the death metal scene that I do. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, that, speaking that was cool talking to Rob, man, talking about MOD, SOD. So it sounds to me it's very cool that they do play a lot of SOD stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, I think I think on their, their uh, European tour, which we were talking about, uh, it was about half the songs were MOD, half were SOD, which is great because wow. uh, I, I very much doubt we're going to see another SOD tour. So, Yes, I I would definitely check that out if and when they come to the area, man, or to the Death Fest, like we were talking about. There's a lot. Geez, every time I look at the bill, there's always some band like Violence is playing and Onslaught is playing, and um, there's always some old school thrash. Oh, uh, 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 um, Corner is coming again this year. So yeah, there's always some cool thrash, old school thrash bands that play at the Death Fest. So maybe they'll maybe they'll squeeze them in. Maybe they'll come one day. And speaking Which of old, that... old school, as you mentioned, old school, we were going to throw in a c couple of album recommendations that I guess would classify as old school. Yep, Skull and Steve Oz picks of the century. And what what was your pick this week? Oh, okay. I will go first. I was just going to say um, it was very cool. I really wanted to pick his brain about uh, New York because it's that's kind of a it's it's a different world. New York is a different world in all facets, including music, just like L.A. And but, you know, New, the New York scene had its own ecosystem and its own rock stars and all that stuff. And, you know, because Kiss famously is from there and um and the Ramones and all these amazing bands. But I wanted to talk to him about, you know, Peter Steele because Peter Steele is a personal, um, I'm, you know, huge fan of his, you know, um, and he's a personal favorite of mine and a personal, you know, kind of a musical hero, if you will, a bit. I know he was, poor guy, idiot. I know he was like seven feet tall and 300 pounds or whatever, and he was, you know, you know, and he was a bit of, you know, a, a deep depressed type of character or moody or that that was her persona anyway. But um, I wanted to ask him because in the New York scene, you know, people kind of it was just like in any scene, it's a kind of incestuous and people know each other. And and um, I wanted to ask him about that. And it turns out that he did, you know, they toured together and they played a show together. And um, he said he was a really cool guy, and I, I can only imagine. Um, I mean, I because like my one of my favorite albums that I'm getting ready to present is like it means a lot to me and some other friends as well, including Kalel, you know, from Black Manta, Damnation, etc. Huge fan of this album. And um, the thing is, is like, also, I didn't really get a chance to see them at the time because they they played kind of the east coast a little bit a lot of those bands even though they had a label back then because we were kids like if you were if you had an album out you were a rock star you know you just assumed that like they were like made millions of dollars and were driving around in these tour buses you just made you just assumed that you didn't know yeah. that they were just like 
doing it on the weekends or struggling or kids or whatever, you know, doing it part time. Um, so um, I didn't get to see them. None of us really got to see them back in the heyday. But the cool thing about Peter Steele is when Typo broke big with Bloody Kisses, that was like 93 or 4 or 92 93 when that album broke big he you know that album basically i think went gold on it was roadrunner's first gold record something like that was a pretty just a huge deal for an indie label underground label and when they got big to his surprise he wanted to pay it back a little bit and so he went back to his old mates his carnivore mates his band pre typo negative and he wanted to pay it back a little bit. So I guess that when there was a break in between, you know, the albums, Typo albums, he went back and he got his friends from uh, Carnivore and they did a small tour. And luckily I was able to see them. Um, so I was able to see them three times. I was able to see them in DC, I rarely, rarely if i've ever done anything like this but i got to see them in dc i got to see them in new york and i got to see them in rhode island all within a few months of each other and they're all crazy legendary shows i don't know if you know this but um did you get covered in blood or anything like that yes <laughs> we did because so have you heard about this you know this story uh, uh well I've heard, I've heard some of the um antics on stage that uh, carnival used to get involved with so back in the even before in the 80s they they would go to the local butcher shop or whatever and get a five gallon bucket of blood and bits and pieces and eyeballs or whatever and they would dump it onto the audience and they they took that gimmick with them into the 90s so this was i was in school so this is around 93 94 or so and they were still doing it which i thought was kind of cool to keeping it real so me and my friend eric and uh you know a couple of us, other of us went and saw them outside of dc and me and eric were in the front and we got drenched in blood there's a picture of us i'll have to track it down one day but we're we head to toe we it's our our skin is red they're are caked on blood and you can see our eyes are like popped open like this and we have like blood <laughs> caked on us and so that was that show and the new york show they had sides of beef now i'm talking about like literal sides of beef there was like they threw out a leg of lamb or a leg of cow or something and there was a guy that was moshing with it. He picked it up and he was moshing around in the pit with like this leg of lamb. It was totally ridiculous. And the third time I saw him, when I saw him in Providence, he actually, he, we were like, hey, are you guys, are you, are you bringing out the bucket of blood? Where's the bucket of blood? And he's like, well, we didn't have time to make it to the butcher. They didn't have time to make it to the butcher that time. But, um, well, anyway, if you can guess, the viewers can guess. I'm sure they can by now. The album I picked is Carnivore Retaliation. Let me get rid of some of the glare here. Maybe that will help a little bit with the glare. Oh, no, it didn't help at all. But anyway, we were talking about hardcore albums and what album, you know, to kind of tied in with, uh, with Rob and, you know, maybe the hardcore scene and the, the New York scene. And then once again there's a million albums i could have picked i could have picked you know age of coral um you know and for me you know everyone's different but i you know best wishes that's more of another crossover album but a lot, a lot of people would know of cro mags but may not have heard of carnival yeah because they weren't around that long i know i know they yeah they weren't around that long shows after they broke up but they're 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 time as a band when they actually recorded albums was fairly short yeah it was fairly short and then but he did forge ahead um you know the first typo album is called slow deep and hard still has a bit of a carnivore thrashy vibe to it so if you like carnivore if you like this i would recommend 
you know, I love type, you know, typo anyway, but the first one is still has a bit of a thrashy edge to it. But this album in particular, I mean, this album is almost a religion for a few select individuals, including me and Hillel and some of our other friends, Eric Johnson and a few other people. This album is almost a fucking religion. We worship this album. Every time this album came on, it was like we were channeling the power of Carnivore, Peter Steele, and Loki, the god of chaos. Because we would put, I mean, we'd be partying, and all of a sudden the mosh pit would, you know, break out, and a table would get broken, or a bottle would get smashed over someone's head, whatever. This album is just amazing. I mean, everything, of you know, the greatest love song of all time, Jack Daniels and Pizza. I don't know if you know what that song's about. It's basically him throwing up into a toilet. And so that's how the album starts. <laughs> and um, so you, right off the bat, you know what you're getting into. And then like the double bass, Angry Neurotic Catholics, song, track three, Suck My Dick, um, Ground Zero Brooklyn, Race War, Jesus, Hitler, Technophobia, Five Billion Dead, Sex and Violence. Anyway, I skipped a couple, but this album is a masterpiece. In fact, um, once again, I have rarely done this in my, you know, this is one of the many relics and artifacts within the Chamber of the Cosmos, this amazing, colossal um post-apocalyptic album which is this is basically the soundtrack to the apocalypse this is what post-apocalyptic warriors listen to this is what mad max listens to in his car when you're not paying attention it's this album and maybe rain and blood but really this album is what the post-apocalyptic warriors are listening to and um it's like I said, I don't really do this a whole lot, but it, among my relics and artifacts within the Chamber of the Cosmos, this is one of the few albums that I actually had signed. So when I met them, when I saw them in Providence, we went, it was a tiny little club. It's called, if any viewers out there from Providence, old school metalheads, or, and even, you know, there was a lot of uh, grunge bands came through this small little club. There was a club called, it was called Club Babyhead. And that was the name of the club in Providence. And a lot of amazing metal bands came through there. We'll talk about that in the future, but a lot of death metal bands came through there. Um, Cause that everything, you know, that was, that was it. I mean, everything was striking hot at the time. I mean, and um, it was a tiny little club. We wanted to meet him. We were like, fuck it. We're just going to go meet him this one time. I made sure I had a sharp, my Sharpie ready. You always have to have that Sharpie ready. So I go and knock on the door. I was like, we want to meet him. They were like, sure, everyone, they were super cool about it. The manager, whoever was like, yeah, he's over on the side. They open the door. He's banging some chick. Pete Steele was seven foot tall, like Kurgan size, like Viking monster, 300, 250 pounds or whatever he is, banging some, you know, Rhode Island chick, some, some groupie was you who probably fell in love with him from typo anyway he's putting his pants on when we open the he opens the door he's putting his pants on yo all right i'll be right there to sign your sign your record damn it so he comes over he's there's a the girl's not embarrassed at all i mean it's it's fucking pete Steele. she's probably you know gl still glowing so um she doesn't give a shit she's lying there and he zips up his pants, comes over, and he's like, all right, yep, okay, here you go. He signs, he does the, the triple sphere and everything, and he's like, yo, and this, this was before the show. The show hadn't even happened yet, So we, because we got there early, because we had intended on him signing and all this stuff. Super cool guy. Hope you guys have a great show. I mean, he's like, we're going to have a great show. You guys are going to love it, blah, blah, blah. Super fucking cool guy. Um I even got it signed by Louis Buteau or Beto, Louis Beto, the drummer, got it signed by Mark. Um, that, at that time, uh, 
Pete was calling him a, um, the hell was he calling him? He, he was calling him a terrorist. He's gonna look at Mark the terrorist over here. He shaved his fucking head and grew a beard. It looks like a fucking a terrorist now. You know, with these New York accents, it was hilarious. But anyway, Mark signed it too. But by, at that time, he had already shaved his head and was growing a beard. Um, anyway, man, this album, like I said, part religion, part music. And this is what the post, post-apocalyptic warriors from this point forward listen, listen to when you're not paying attention. The, that, the Ayatollah of rock and roll. The, this, this is what the Ayatollah of rock and roll plays to all of those bands of post, post-apocalyptic lunatics out there in the wasteland when they're looking for some juice. Anyway, that's my pick. Um, go and check it out. I highly recommend it. Probably means so much to me, man. One, one of the single greatest hardcore slash thrash crossover albums of all time. Production, song-wise, musicianship, it's all there. The energy there, the synergies there, the magic is there, the power is there. It's all right here. Go check it out. So... That probably would have been a, that would have been a perfect album for Rob to be listening to as he escaped from New York. <laughs> exactly. Um, I've got I've got a, a band that uh, I'm guessing that almost nobody has ever heard of on who's watching this show uh, because it's a, it's a Russian band as we we were talking to Rob uh, a lot of Russian bands uh, people in the West aren't familiar with and it, it, they originally formed in 84 so they were, were a, so, a Soviet Union band before obviously the dissolution mm. of the Soviet Union and that band is called Krozia Matala what? Krozia Matala how's your Russian? so it basically means uh, a corrosion of metal um, oh and um, I thought you sneezed <laughs> Not quite. I'm gonna say God bless you. Yeah, and 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 it's it's funny because um, they they were known to be shock rockers, like Carnival were the shock rockers, you know, throwing blood and mm. stuff, blood and guts over the audience. Is is Karozi Matoa when they were um, in their heyday, which is like late eighties, early nineties, is that they had these wild stage shows. They would have naked women on stage. Uh, Whoa! Yeah, they'd have these dwarves. Um, with flippers, you know, dwarves and naked women and semi, flippers. Yeah, I think it was semi-naked dwarves, but completely naked women. Um, and sounds like a fucking David Lynch movie. Yeah, and that because one of their songs, which which is on the album, I'm going to talk talk about, was called AIDS. And so they would they would actually bring out a coffin because obviously the AIDS epidemic was going through the world mm. at the time. They actually have a bring out a coffin with AIDS written on it, you know, to get that shock. To shock the wow. audience, so they they, they were, <laughs> you know, in, in a way they they were they're trying to provoke that response from the audience, in, in, similar mm-hmm. to Carnival, just in a different way, in a different hemisphere, I guess. Um, and as I mentioned, they, were, they, they I think they were formed in '84, and each of the band members were known by nicknames. So the founder of the band is known as Pauk. Now you know what Pauk means in Russian, don't you? Yes. Yes. Um, bear, right? <laughs> no, that's Medved. So it means uh, spider. So they, they, they each had these uh, nicknames. Um, and the front man uh, was... Uh, I uh, thought it sur- meant like radioactive bear or something like that. Not quite. No. No. Uh, and, the, and the front man, Sergei, uh, he was known as Borov, which is a boar, like a wild boar. Um, mm. But they, uh, I think their first album was um, uh, uh, called Orden Satani, which is the Order of Satan or Satan's Order. And it was actually recorded twice. It's kind of like the first version sounds more like a demo recording, uh, but mm. the second uh, studio album sounds a lot better, and that's the, the version I prefer. And uh, I never actually was able to hunt down a copy of the album, um, but I was given, I was in Minsk about 15 years ago and I, uh, randomly ran into metalheads and they found out I was into metal as well. And so they put together some, some CDs, uh, 
based on some MP3s that they had and introduced me to a bunch of um, Russian bands. And mm. this was probably the best album that they, they sent me, um, Satan's Order. Uh, I'll have to check that out. It, it's, it's, it's eight, I think it was eight tracks, and it, it's a mix of straight out speed metal and mid tempo uh, thrash metal. And mm. as much as I love their, 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 their faster music, uh, the the best songs, look, looking beyond this album as well, probably their mid tempo songs. They're probably the more famous songs. So if you check out on this particular album, um, you know songs like um, Phantom, uh, 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 the, the mid tempos, some of the other famous mid tempos that they had Thrash around the Kremlin and Come to Sabbath. Uh, great mm. great mid tempo thrash songs, but they also had songs such as. Um, uh, speed, which means AIDS in Russian, uh, mm. heroin or, or heroin in, in Russian, and Chorny uh, Terra, which is black crocodile. <laughs> no, no, that's crocodile uh, in Russian. You got you got to brush up, mate. Um, so, yeah. so, so, so it's like her that's heroin on crack. <laughs> I've never tried it. Uh, me either. Oh. Oh, Only my a, eyeballs. Yeah. So it, it's definitely a band if you if you love thrash metal, speed metal, definitely check it out. Um, as I said, the frontman Sergey, he's kind of known as the Tom Araya in, in in Russia, and just in terms of having that distinctive thrash vocals. Mm. Um, and the only the only other thing I was able to hunt down was a, a compilation album. Um, so I hope to be able to get get a, get a hold of a proper album in the future but yeah you have um, to send me the link i have to check those guys out yeah yeah absolutely um so yeah i might i might be bringing a few more russian albums because it's just um some great music that's i see a theme untapped. here with you steve oz well i want to i want to I, I want to share the, the music that people have never heard of so we'll have to do well, some more black man mission accomplished <laughs> Because no one's ever heard of that band before. If you not no, it's not true. If you're in Russia, they were they were one of the biggest thrash bands. Legendary. That's they, true. And, and the um, the band kind of I'm not sure whether it was the the shock rock element or the tendencies of the 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 founder of the band, but they kind of went in a nationalist skinhead direction. And more punk and so basically the other band members i thought that i think they just got sick of it or weren't interested in going that direction and they they left the band over 20 years ago but they recently probably in the last five years reformed the the other three mm. members of the band and played under the name corrosion and and played the the old school songs so but i'm, I'm not sure whether they're still kicking about uh doing anything live yeah. Cool. So, that's another another showdown. Another showdown. Another one to go. Another one down. One. one to go. Yep. Well, I just wanted to say one last thing. Um, if you're out there, Peter Steele, I know you're out there floating around in the ether somewhere in the great beyond. Great gig in the sky. We love you, man. You made a lot of great music. You made a lot of people happy. Um, so thank you for that. You know, you gentle giant, wherever you are. And uh, I just wanted to say, remember, look to the stars, carry the torch of enlightenment, and strive to be a disciple of rock and roll in the Brotherhood of Orpheus. <laughs>
Oh, <laughs> 